Well, good afternoon. Uh, I have the privilege of repeating myself um, and the introduction I gave of our speaker a few minutes ago not being fully aware that there was a 30-minute break planned between the remarks. Um, so it gives me additional pleasure um, to introduce John Byrne. Let's recall that he is a distinguished professor of energy and climate policy at the University of Delaware. He is the um, director of the board of the Foundation for Renewable Energy and the Environment, an international organization dedicated to the issues about which we all care very much. And he is a recipient among a group of people uh, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007, working on a panel of critical issues in the area of climate change. So I think I got that right this time. And there isn't any break, right, Scott? Yeah. Fantastic. Please welcome as enthusiastically as you did before, but perhaps with more, the real John Byrne. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you very much. That was special. I don't think that ever happened before. So, uh, <laughs> so I want to um, uh, take a just a minute uh, to say thank you to many folks. Uh, oh, I have to get in my right place. Sorry, now I'm in my right place. Uh, so I want to uh, take a, just a couple of minutes to thank everyone. I am very, very thankful to be here today uh, at Evergreen State College uh, community. I uh, really uh, very much appreciate the invitation from the president. And uh, this, is a, this is a story that only a small number know, but there was a time in the last century when I was thinking about what was the right place to apply for a faculty position, and Evergreen State College was uh, high on the list. And the only uh, problem that we ran into, my wife uh, Beth of, uh, has lived her entire life on the East Coast, and the thought of uh, pulling her away from uh, all of that unfortunately didn't make it work, but I have to say, coming back, it's still a, an incredibly dynamic community. You have, a, I think, a special stewardship responsibility. This community has been a leader for a long time in these issues, and um, I'm, uh, I'm really honored to, uh, to be here again. And I do want to express my thanks to uh, Scott Morgan, who has, uh, I don't know how he does it, I don't know where that special abundant energy machine is that he plugs into, but uh, anyway, he's unbelievably hardworking and uh, thoughtful. I really appreciate the ability to uh, have had uh, the chance to talk with you uh, throughout this period. I want to also just congratulate everybody. Um, I did have a chance to uh, join sessions today, and uh, it's been a great day, I got to say. <laughs> I mean, this was really quite, uh, quite impressive. In fact, I'd say it's a grand day, and part of the um, uh, challenge that then presents to me, I am at the end of this phase of the, uh, of the program, but I don't want to be the conclusion to the program because it's, it's, it's really been such a great conversation and I hope um, ways will be found to sustain what was built today in the way of conversation. So instead of being the conclusion, what I'd like to propose to you is I'd, I'd like to spend a few moments uh, with you to talk a little bit about what uh, in the world happened <laughs> that got us into this problem that we're now trying uh, eagerly to solve, uh, hopefully offer dimensions that I think actually resonate with what I have heard uh, on campus today. You've really, I think, just done wonderfully. I'm not talking about simply the presenters. I'm talking about the questions and answers. Microphones, people lined up, you know, I mean, this was really good. <laughs> it was encouraging to see uh, this kind of enthusiasm um, uh, for the topic. So, um, I'm going to try instead to give you a sense, at least as best I can, uh, uh, about what did happen, how did we get into this problem, and um, a, a bit on how we might at least, you've already worked on wonderful tools throughout the day, from urban farms to uh, fish culture to uh, recycling to uh, uh, education to, I mean, it's, it's, this has really been a very comprehensive conversation today. So I'm not proposing, I'm just going to try and offer a couple of thoughts on how we can move forward and as you probably are aware, move forward quickly um, because we have unfortunately lost a lot of time uh, in uh, discussions that did not turn out uh, to produce what we needed, and uh, so now we need to move even more quickly than we did before. And uh, in that vein, I just want to say I 
Yeah, for many people, infrastructure is boring. Reese is right, but I gotta say, <laughs> we are at that moment where if we make the right set of decisions on infrastructure, we will solve this problem. Now, I don't know how optimistic that, but I think I'm a real optimist on this point, but we have to make a concerted effort in order to make this happen. And if we don't, we're gonna be in trouble. I'd like to expand the meaning of infrastructure just a bit. Uh, we were for a long time in uh, the College of Engineering at my university, so uh, that I'm not trying to move away from the engineer's perspective, but I do think we need to include policy and social uh, systems as part of that infrastructure. So I'm gonna be trying, if I can, to tweak a little bit and put, the, put those together uh, for that purpose. So that's my, that's my goal, and uh, I'm gonna just offer you a, a way forward. Uh, I was asked to use this word. This is sort of like a term of art that people have gotten interested in, in polycentric, so I just wanna give you the, the, uh, the, the, the important meaning for this moment, okay? Polycentric, after 21 years of trying to negotiate a treaty on this matter, at a single center with a bunch of countries around that center, we finally realized maybe we need to find another strategy in which we engage and empower a variety of centers of activity rather than depending upon one and only one. I'm gonna speak a little bit on Paris if you don't mind, but I don't think we wanna get caught up in depending on Paris in order to address this problem. In fact, if we're gonna solve this problem, what this conversation has been about here today is really what's going to, going to do it. If we don't have all of our communities doing it, the real implementers in any kind of change that I know about are the, uh, are the communities. They are what we normally call in U.S. parlance state and uh, local levels. That's where things get implemented. And uh, if we don't get the innovation of the implementers, we don't have enough time. We will not, uh, unfortunately, we will not be able to address this problem in time. So. With that, that's what polycentric is. I'm gonna make a case. We need to have everyone in, not just waiting for some international discussion of this and that to make the, uh, the thing go. So let me start um, uh, with uh, how did we get into the problem? In brief, the answer is success. This is a, on one of my degrees is in economics and I often say I'm a recovering economist. Uh, <laughs> This is a mad economist, actually a really brilliant guy uh, in the Netherlands uh, who worked tirelessly and you have to consider how hard it was to get per capita GNP data for the 16th century, okay? But, but anyway, <laughs> he worked, okay, to try and get that. And if you do what economists normally do in normalizing in that, in that regard, until the last 100 years or so, uh, the human population lived in an economic setting that didn't change very much. I'm talking about for the whole population. Obviously there's, and I'm gonna get into that, there's obviously big disparities inside of any period of time, but there was very little. You may not have known it when you checked your, your cash and wherever you have it stashed, uh, but you're living in the wealthiest time of human civilization. This is it. <laughs> it doesn't get much better than this, at least for the current history. And you can see on display what it means. So this is a commonly used way to express that. What happens in 100 years? This is the same intersection in New York City from 1890 to today. You can see the way of life in the upper left hand in 1890. You can see what it looks like today. The energy density in that lower uh, bottom uh, image of what it means to live in our world today is, I think, telling of just what happened when GDP per capita went up like a rocket, okay? That took us 100 years to do it, and uh, I'm not sure I like all of those discussions that go on about, you know, whether the U.S. or what. Anyway, the U.S. was often said to be the one that sort of propelled this new model into the world. This new model is around, out and about in the world. So I'd like to introduce you to the city of Seoul. This is the city of Seoul in 1950 before war breaks out. You'll see why I'm doing this in a second. On your left is the city of Seoul amid a devastating war that flattens uh, one of the ancient great cities of uh, our civilization. This is Seoul today. 
What took 100 years in the US took 50 years in Korea, in Seoul, to build that new, gleaming, modern development model, OK? It's quite remarkable. That's not where the lead is now. This is 1980 Shenzhen. Anybody know Shenzhen? You should. Oh, you do. Good. <laughs> you should. In 1980, you probably didn't. It was mainly a warehouse uh, city and um, uh, some uh, fishery um, uh, business uh, to boot. 1980. Twenty-five years, <laughs> the develop model, development model accelerated at a pace that is breathtaking. I mean, I don't think most people who have lived through this could imagine how that could happen. You would go from roughly 800,000 people to several million people in 25 years. And what is made in Shenzhen? An awful lot of your iPhones and other Apple equipment and uh, a lot of the, uh, the high-tech industry assembles in Shenzhen including solar cells, which will be an interesting story in a couple of minutes. So, okay. so this is the world that we're in. We have changed. We are in a, an era of, at least by historical standards, luxury. That luxury has not only changed the content of life, it's changed the rhythm of life. We are on pace to do things at a rate that has never been seen before in human history. Uh, it's economics, it's politics, it's, uh, and of course, it's environment. So the companion curve that belongs with this particular curve is this one. That's per capita CO2 emissions, per capita CO2 emissions that uh, hugs per capita income. Our economic model of success is a high carbon model. It is what it is. I mean, you know, you can, but that is the basis for what has been until now um, the modern case of development. The argument that some make that this twinning of these two uh, somehow puts environment and economy at odds with one another is actually wrong, and I'm going to try and uh, indicate why that is in a moment, okay? But that we cannot stay on the existing model is true. This level of carbon intensity, as it repeats around the world, this level of energy intensity that then goes to carbon intensity that repeats around the world, is not sustainable. And you know some of the elements of what that, that uh, unsustainability or unstable character looks like of a climate system. So this is uh, on the East Coast in 2012. This is what happens along the New Jersey coast when uh, Superstorm Sandy rolls through. Superstorm Sandy flooded the, um, uh, the tubes of the uh, New York City subway on Reese's point on infrastructure. The, everything we knew was built to say that those, those tubes could not flood. <laughs> they did. Uh, you've been experiencing this past year um, the kind of volatility that is now in the climate system because of these stored uh, chemicals that are mainly from about 75, 80 percent of the greenhouse gases come from the energy si uh, system, and you've been experiencing what, what uh, happens uh, along the Northwest with this. Uh, one of the most uh, significant fire seasons, both in, in intensity and in uh, area, uh, that is on record. Um, Perhaps this past 60 years, Alaska has warmed than any other place on the planet. Uh, and uh, it's already at 3 degrees uh, uh, Fahrenheit. And uh, we're thinking that by uh, the end of, uh, by mid-century, it's going to add another 2 to 4 degrees Fahrenheit, which, again, from everything that we know, and that is what you have to work on, from everything that we know, that is unbelievably dangerous. OK? So, um, these are the kinds of, uh, of risks that we're now taking. It's not risks I don't think that most people ever sort of signed up for and said, yeah, you know, that high energy lifestyle that I have is worth so much that I'm willing to take these risks. But it is the problem that we now uh, need to confront. In the midst of this confrontation, it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of unfortunate, but anyway, let me say it. <laughs> Both the distribution of benefits of that wealth 
and of harms of that wealth are not equal. While we are unbelievably richer than we used to be, I think to move the, I know I'm not supposed to, but to move the, to hit the video bar, do I, can I do it on here? Which one can I, can I just do it on top or yeah, just hit there, yeah. So this is an interesting um, uh, data uh, scan that, uh, that uh, uh, Noah created in which it took the same hour, hour of night for the same day from satellites for around the world. And what you can see is the light scatter. This is only electric light. This is not heat. This was not heat sensitive photography. This is the availability of electric light at night in our world. And as you can see, as we rotate here into China, you can see and uh, others, but as, if you were following that, there are significant portions of the, of, uh, the human um, society that are not able to afford or do not have access to the light bulb that was invented 110, 115 years ago, okay? So the benefits are not equal. And similarly, the risks are not equal. This is in the US, this is uh, Hurricane Katrina and who was stranded after uh, this storm uh, burst, uh, uh, burst the, uh, uh, the retaining walls. Um, these trucks and so on, as you can see, and where people are trying to live out of uh, these vehicles are because there is no ability to move them anymore and people have no place to go. And so uh, we experienced the trauma in, in the United States that uh, uh, reminds us of who is most at risk from uh, this problem. But worldwide, the risks are even greater. This is, uh, uh, I'm gonna give you just a quick profile of what is uh, at risk in the case of Bangladesh, one of the poorest uh, of our human community. Uh, and this is uh, um, a very rich delta. You can see sort of in the middle here, yeah in here where uh, a great deal of, uh, and of course along the coast, a great deal of what uh, daily life in Bangladesh depends upon. Um, it used to be that Bangladesh was at risk of five meter storm surges. This was a kind of thing that was within the uh, weather record of, uh, of the Bay of Bengal. But, uh, uh, and so about five million people were at risk when these storms would roll through. But the predictions now are that we're gonna hit something closer to seven meter storm surges. And that dark blue that you see here will be underwater uh, for Bangladeshis and uh, life will be uh, obviously utterly transformed. Um, Bangladesh's, as you know, Bangladesh's contribution to this problem is somewhere between zero and none, and, uh, but uh, are at great risk. And that is partly why the conversation on this issue has not, uh, stopped focusing on mitigation, on how do we stop these gases from concentrating in the atmosphere, but also to adaptation, because we have a significant portion of our human population, as well as other forms of life, which I will close this uh, talk with, uh, that are at risk. After two years of being battered by uh, high intensity storms that hit the central part of Philippines, and on, you know, and I, I don't know what you want. Anyway, an unusual uh, concurrence of events took place two weeks before uh, the uh, international community was to meet uh, in Warsaw for the uh, discussion of the Climate Change Convention. Philippines got hit again, third year in a row. And uh, at that point, its ambassador um, uh, took the floor two weeks later in Warsaw and uh, asked, you know, when are we going to do something about this? And uh, I thought used a fairly uh, telling uh, expression of what we were doing, carbon intensive gathering of useless frequent flyers. We had for 20, at this point, 19 years failed to come up with an agreement on what to do. Unfortunately, his plea was not answered at that time, but I would say that we're closer this time with the Paris Accord. Not because the Paris Accord has established targets to reduce, that, that we are going to reduce greenhouse gases by. That's not the reason why I think, in my personal opinion, why Paris is important. The reason why Paris is important is that for the first time in 21 years, the discussion was no longer about a single 
centered regulatory system that the countries would agree to, like what was uh, the aspiration of Kyoto Protocol, and then figure out how to enforce it. We spent an enormous amount of time trying to design that system, and we spent an enormous amount of time talking about how to enforce it. I think our European colleagues would tell you they're the only ones who stood up something of any scale, and I think they will tell you it was a real pain. It didn't work. Very little reduction can be attributed to the scheme, and an enormous amount of, unfortunately, creative energy was spent on both sides, those who violated the, uh, the, uh, the target and those who tried to catch them. And uh, we didn't do very well. What was remarkable about Paris is that for the first time, the conversation shifted away from this sort of centered discussion of how to solve the problem to what we call a polycentric strategy. Indeed, for two weeks, the discussions, both in the so-called blue zone, where the uh, negotiators and so on are, and the observer organizations are, and where the non-governmental community was in uh, another uh, part of uh, uh, the same general area uh, in Le Bourget in, in Paris, those discussions were almost entirely around implementation around people sharing ideas like you did today on what things are working and uh, what are our challenges and how can we put together research and how can we put together investment and how can we put together policy in some uh, coherent way. And I think that's important because it means that we're no longer betting on a small number of negotiators that are going to somehow work out an arrangement uh, for us to follow. We're instead now really following, you know, it's now up to us, but we are now really following our willingness to commit to do something serious about this issue. And the enthusiasm with which the uh, final accord was greeted by people from all over the world uh, gives me hope, maybe I'm also too optimistic, but gives me hope that we're going to try this time to try and address this, uh, this problem. In that vein, one might just ask the question. <laughs> you could compare what our federal government has done as our center of political gravity, and you could compare what the states and the cities have done. This is off of a paper that we wrote back in 2007, which at the time, there were 23 states that required as a condition of sale of electricity into their jurisdiction that some specified percentage had to be renewable energy. At that time, there were eight states that actually required a reduction in at least electricity sales or energy sales as a condition of those uh, companies uh, working in those states. And 38 states said, if you build it, you get to, <laughs> you get to receive the, uh, the same amount of money that you would pay from the grid you get to receive when you put it back into the grid, okay? Just based on that state action alone, against what was the forecast of where the U.S. would be in 2020, there was 65% less carbon dioxide because of state action. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's not enough. BAU, I'm sorry, I, I got scolded yesterday on using that term. Uh, business as usual, getting back to a flat line will not work in this case. We are somewhere in need of a 60 to 80% reduction. So. <laughs> Uh, getting back to where we were won't be enough. But states, by their activities in 2007, had already gotten us a significant way along. We've updated this. We haven't published the paper yet, so I can't, you know, I feel like you were trying with Reese not to inf divulge entirely what the study is going to say before it bounces out on the street. But anyway, We've moved from 23 states to 37 states that require as a condition of sale the use of renewable energy. We have a whopping 26 states, a majority of American states that say you must use less energy if you are going to be uh, part of our state community. Uh, 44 network, uh, net metering uh, states as a result, okay? That's pretty good. Uh, it's actually very good. And uh, it's not enough. We're still way, way, way away from where we need to be but it is an important shift. If you look at our cities, uh, which includes, uh, I don't know exactly how, but anyway, so there is Seattle, and then of course there's everybody that's connected to Seattle, so I don't know, you know how exactly the local culture wants to say about that, I don't like Seattle, or I want to lay claim, but anyway, Seattle is part of the C40. Those are the 40 largest cities in the world that are working on some of the most aggressive uh, strategies for carbon reduction. 
that are out there. The, the C40 strategy is far more aggressive than anything even that the European Union proposed, okay? There's nothing like what's happening in these cities compared to what our national governments or our regional uh, uh, governments like the European Union were willing to do. If you add to that uh, the Carbon Disclosure Project uh, program, the ECLE program, the Conference of Mayors, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, please, okay, but I'm, <laughs> we got over a thousand cities with over a third of our population, okay, uh, that are actually trying to meet significant standards far greater than what Kyoto Protocol had made, and in many cases, if you look at the track that these cities are on, they have either met or they are very near to meeting uh, the standards that they have adopted. You know, <laughs> maybe we shouldn't work just on <laughs> a single center to tell us what to do, you know? Maybe we should learn from this variety, this diversity of activity, this diversity of commitment, this diversity of experiment in trying to bend the carbon curve. I just had a few moments, so please don't throw tomatoes. I just, <laughs> I'm just saying, that in this area, you are very well known for a whole lot of creativity on a lot of fronts, okay, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this particular um, area. And I'm just offering that, you know, it's like everything. It's, it's everything from changing the transit system to changing the, uh, uh, the food system to uh, changing, uh, you know, just how we, Streets, sometimes, you know, it's really possible. You can ride bikes on them and you can walk on them too. You don't have to. San Francisco had a great experiment where they closed the center city to all cars against great resistance by the, um, uh, by the business community initially. This was uh, done by a colleague, actually a graduate of our program, Johanna Gregory Parton. She's now with C40. But at the time she was with San Francisco, she put through this program once a month no cars in the center city. You now cannot beat back with a, bit, a, a, a stick the business support for this policy, and why? Because when people retook the streets of the center, they went downtown. They actually thought, you know, yeah, I could get downtown, I don't have to worry about parking anymore, and I'll. they set up transit, they set up a variety of ways in which people could then reconnect with their downtown. Savings, not overwhelming, but savings are important, okay? This was originally proposed to be two months a year. It's now every year, I mean every month uh, in, uh, in San Francisco. It's this kind of innovation that I'd like to propose to you as part of what we're going to have to harness if we're going to get there. We're going to have to find a way to engineer an infrastructure. So I think what Reese did on the front end is absolutely vital. I told him, you know, <laughs> before. I really appreciate the work that you've done, and I think that's critical that we have that discussion on an ongoing basis, and I was really pleased to hear that you've got this set up and you've got monthly discussions and people are really seriously trying. I'm just saying you're gonna to have to also tap into other parts of the community in order to make this work. Common question <laughs> when you get to this, can we afford large change? Can we shift from a fossil-free system, that's a question that the first session uh, brought up, uh, and uh, the answer is yes but you've got to figure out how to do it. This is actually the same study that, uh, <laughs> that uh, Reese uh, uh, mentioned. The data comes from that. Climate Bonds Initiative took it from the McKinsey folks. In the power sector alone, the world is going to spend $12 trillion. The key question is not is there enough money. I think for almost any idea that we have on the planet, $12 trillion just in the energy sector alone is enough to work with. I mean, we can probably find a way to do a few things if we have 12 trillion. The question is, are we gonna direct the 12 trillion to, re, to, uh, to, to just reinforce the existing system or are we going to begin the significant change that we need to make? So I think it's just, you know, sometimes we get a little confused on these things. The point here is not whether we can afford it. It's really down to whether and how we will decide to build that new system because the ability to do it is there. But I want to give you another way in which you can think about that. <clears throat> and a way that you can think about it is when you 
are on the financial side of the energy equation, you can either buy energy, that is you can use it and pay the price to use it, or you can save energy and you can pay the price to save, okay? This is for a group of states, the, the orange bars are what uh, customers in each state pay for the use of electricity. I just did electricity here, so <laughs> there's more, but I just did electricity. The upper part of the bar is what residential customers pay, the bottom part of the bar is what uh, industrial customers pay, okay? After binning data for about 10 years, these are the actual all-in costs, not only the cost that the utility incurred to get you to, to, to incentivize you to save, but also the cost you paid. So if you buy the high efficiency light bulb, there's two parts to the, to the cost. There's the part that you receive from the utility that writes down the initial cost for you, but you still have to pay for the rest. This is the all-in cost to save, okay? The all-in cost to save shows you something very, very important. There is a clear, obvious gap between how much it costs to use energy or electricity and how much it costs to save. How big is that gap? If you assume a fairly, I think, reasonable, from, uh, from a technical point of view, a fairly reasonable assumption we can make is that most buildings built in the United States uh, can offer, at least on average, about a 20% saving by efficiency upgrades. So you can take 20% of what that, that uh, energy bill is and you can offer it up as an alternative, okay? So 20% of the bill is 72.6 billion, cost to save using these states' experience, the cost to save, $33 billion. $39 billion ready for self-financing investment, okay? It is possible that these kinds of projects not only uh, cost less than use, but there's actually a significant enough dividend to provide the financial basis for funding this shift, okay? If you wanted to know the numbers on, uh, on your state, on Washington, we penciled them in quickly. So, I mean, you can check your own budget, but I don't think you're spending $400 million a year or anywhere near $400 million a year on energy efficiency uh, upgrades. But you have a surplus that would enable you to do those projects now. It is available but you gotta redirect it. So, how do you do that? <sighs> which brings us to <laughs> something called the Sustainable Energy Utility, which we invented originally in Delaware. It is now operating in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Washington, D.C., part of California, and in discussion in other places, and then, of course, overseas. Here is what we did. Using the same basic economic principles, we created the conditions through the Sustainable Energy Utility, a nonprofit independent of government, that public and nonprofit agencies could come in and say, okay, evaluate us, get these, uh, get these engineering companies that uh, know a bit about uh, how to improve performance, get these companies to give guarantees that the savings will be at an amount greater than the debt service to buy the technology, and suddenly the public and nonprofit sectors didn't have to put any of their capital budget in to make this work. That premium was now available for them to finance this opportunity. Does it work? All in cost, there's 73 million, 72 and a half million dollar capital investment when you count all the interest costs and other charges that are made when you finance something uh, on this kind of scale. It was 110 million dollars over a 20 year life of this particular financing. There are guaranteed savings behind this for all of those agencies of the state of 148 million dollars. <laughs> Thus, this is self-financing. If you do it right, it works. Now, I have to tell you, in all my career, I mean, I did not believe that I would appear in something called Moody's or Standard & Poor's to try to make a case for something like this. This was not my practice. I was much more happy and living well in the research world and interdisciplinarity, and I really loved science engineering and policy, and I was very happy. So, 
The sale of these bonds earned a double A-plus rating. If you're not into uh, all of that kind of stuff, there's only one rating higher, which is triple A, okay? It's a double A-plus rating, and in case you were wondering what the United States of America's uh, bond rating is, it's double A-plus. The sustainable energy utility had never financed anything. <laughs> we financed the $72.5 million capital investment, double A-plus rated, and of course the job bump is enormous. You can, you can count on, in terms of job bump, if you want a simple uh, a multiplier for this, you can count on a four to eight, uh, a ratio of four to eight to one. So if you want to invest the same amount of money in the conventional energy sector, it'll get you X jobs. You'll get four to eight times as many jobs if you invest it in uh, these kinds of projects. And if you think about it, you can figure out why that is fairly quickly, okay? These are fairly if you're going to go in and uh, upgrade buildings like this, you, that it's a fairly labor-intensive effort. So uh, is it working? The state of Delaware, uh, which has a AAA rating higher than the U.S., uh, has now given the green light letter to do another one of these financings in the public and nonprofit sector for $75 million this, this year. As I mentioned, we are now working, the foundation was created out of this success, so the Foundation for Renewable Energy Environment that the President kindly mentioned, thank you. <laughs> We're, uh, we are now paired with Pennsylvania Treasury in Pennsylvania. Now, if you know anything about Treasury Departments, Treasury Departments are like the most conservative financially that you're ever going to bump into, okay? They are our partners, okay, with a sustainable uh, energy fund over here, West Penn Power Sustainable Energy Fund, over here that uh, uh, put up the funds for us to, uh, to build uh, this, uh, this program in uh, Pennsylvania. And we're going to uh, release our first um, uh, investment uh, in uh, Pennsylvania in a couple of months. Uh, and it will involve, as you can see, a variety of different uh, public and uh, nonprofit entities. I'm, I'm happy to say why and how and all that, but I do want you to understand this is hitting all income tiers of uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in terms of benefits. So if you were to benchmark it against what we have previously depended upon for the delivery of a more efficient, a more saving, a more conserving uh, future, you could look at how much money the reporting utilities spent and then take a percentage of the savings that they created against their sales. So you're putting in the numerator the savings and in the denominator the sales. For obvious reasons, the business model, and I do understand it and I do appreciate the utility's concern about this, uh, this is not the business model where they, they can make good money. And for that reason, they usually keep this, this, uh, uh, this ratio of savings against uh, uh, sales uh, down below the 5% range. Sustainable energy utility type uh, uh, Organizations that uh, have tried to uh, move ahead on this, one is in your neighborhood, the Energy Trust of Oregon, which I think has done a uh, remarkably good job. Uh, then on the East Coast, the uh, Vermont uh, uh, Efficiency Vermont uh, program run by the Ven uh, uh, Vermont uh, Energy Investment Corporation, which is also a nonprofit, and I just wanted to based upon that bond deal, this was the first time that something of that length was ever done, based upon that, um, this, the state of Delaware will now be in the 25% range of savings against sales. That's a change <laughs> that we can now begin to think about seriously as a way to move forward. Shout out from the White House, shout out from Asian Development Bank. The Asian Development Bank we thought was really important because that's where all the growth is for energy and economy. I know this is not always the best place in the world to talk about uh, solar PV, and I, I'm, I have no stock. I own nothing in uh, the solar companies or anything. Like, that's not my job here. But I do want to just briefly mention that the country that has the most by volume, the most installed solar PV panels in the world is a country called Germany. This is the uh, sun hours, which is uh, very low, <laughs> okay, uh, for Germany, and it's actually lower than the Puget Sound area of. Now, having said that, there are still important dimensions of this that may or may not, uh, that the technology may not work along here, but there's a lot of other parts of Washington where it might work. Here. Please? Here. It can work here. I, I've been in a conversation with colleagues here. Some are a little nervous about it and some, so I'm just, uh, 
since it's not my job to sell you, you're going to figure out how to make it work, not me. So, But I do want to give you an example of what the impact is. So I gave you an example of solar energy, uh, sustainable energy utilities. I want to briefly give you an example of um, Solar City. This is for a vertical city, the city of Seoul, 12 million people living in 24, uh, on average 20 floor high buildings. This is their uh, load uh, curve, load profile in May. That's the peak consumption of the city in May. This is it in August. This is obviously their peak uh, period. If you work that same point that we used a few minutes ago on how to look at how much surplus is available for investment, don't send it to the existing energy system, send it into uh, sustainable energy. If you do the same thing by first improving the performance of these buildings, cutting those by 20%, and all we did in this case was to cut these, uh, these buildings by uh, 20%, then we added this green level is the, the fall in the during daylight hours. This is the 24-hour clock. This is the uh, daylight hours here. And uh, this is what happens if you just use 32% of public buildings, a small percentage of what is available. If you add commercial buildings, wait for it. Mm. <laughs> this is transformative, <laughs> OK? Fossil free. <laughs> This is how you can begin to make uh, substantial changes. And all of this, we have a paper that's already published. I'm not going to bore you with all that. We have gotten into trying to figure this out, not only technically. We didn't use anything but already off-the-shelf standard efficiency PV panels. We did not go for any of the forecasted uh, higher efficiency panels. Um, with that, these programs will pencil with the right kind of policy. These programs will pencil in 10 years. And Seoul is pretty, pretty important in this regard because Seoul has very low retail electricity prices, like a certain state in the Northwest. So <laughs> there is a way. You have to work on it, but there is a way to make this kind of thing happen. 66% of electricity use is, during daylight hours is available from a modest use of the rooftop real estate of the city of Seoul. 31% of all hours. Okay. Two last things I would just want to briefly with you. One is, so can we really do something quick and large? And I just want to offer a recent empirical experience to answer this question. This is the share of something called landlines. Anybody under 25 have no idea what I'm now talking about. <laughs> this was the share of US, uh, I'm sorry, of, uh, of worldwide communications, OK, by landlines. And this is the share of the cell phone. 1986 to 2008, a sea change took place. <laughs> OK? And I do agree that behavioral change is important. That was stressed today by a number of your speakers. But often, behavior change comes with policy and possibly with technology. That is, they're highly interactive. Asking for behavior change to do it alone, maybe, maybe not. But if you do them together, and there's no way I believe that cell phone designers ever thought that all the functionality that is now in the operating system was what they were going to stash in those phones. I mean, most of us still have no idea how to even use most of that capacity, OK, in our phones. And, and we're still discovering all kinds of interesting things that we can do, OK, with that. I think it's an, it's an intersection of policy, uh, technology, people, and of course. So my last uh, thought to you is I just want to take a couple of minutes here. Um, I'm going to offer you a video clip, and I want to tell you about the video clip before I do it, <laughs> OK? So we got into this mess. My proposal to you is we got into this mess because we kind of thought that we could just build and consume and enjoy, and it wouldn't have any long-term adverse impact. If the sustainability paradigm shift is a paradigm in which we say we can still have it all, 
but we will have technologies and other things that reduce it. I'm offering you, maybe this is just a philosophic question, but I'm offering you that we're missing the point. In a basic sense, we need to understand that there's another infrastructure besides the infrastructure that we build that life itself depends upon. And that infrastructure has some pretty awesome features. And this video is about those awesome features. So you're going to hear about a depression in West Africa that has the remains of plankton 100 million years ago that, were, that settled in this depression. And you're going to hear about dust storms that form with regularity each day pick up the remains of, this, of these uh, plankton uh, uh, skeletons and transport them to the Amazon. And if you don't know, the Amazon is where 32% of the oxygen produced for the planet resides. And last thing, just very important for us, for humans, large muscle mammals require a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere <laughs> in order for us to survive and thrive, okay? So you're going to hear about a process, an infrastructure that works on this basis that has a legacy of 100 million years ago that is also part of the infrastructure that we need to understand. And I think if we can be a little bit more respectful about that infrastructure, maybe, just maybe, we really will not only solve the problem in the near term, but also with a little modesty and respect for the other infrastructure, maybe not get ourselves back into the same problem again. So that said, let me, uh, let me ask if we can roll the... The Bodega Depression of the Sahara Desert in North Africa is one of the driest and dustiest places in Earth. <laughs> But more than 100 million years ago, an ocean covered the region. The ocean bed collected skeletons of plankton, whose remains can be found even today amongst the grains of sand in the depression. The plankton provides a rich source of phosphorus, an element needed by all living things to produce energy. But for this nutrient to yield energy, it must first inhabit the Here we go. <laughs> The Bodega Depression of the Sahara Desert in North Africa is one of the driest and dustiest places on Earth. But more than 100 million years ago, an ocean covered the region. The ocean bed collected skeletons of plankton, whose remains can be found even today amongst the grains of sand in the depression. The plankton provides a rich source of phosphorus, an element needed by all living things to produce energy. But for this nutrient to re-enter the chain of life, it must first embark on a long journey. The wind sweeps up a few flakes of sand with the plankton remains. The flakes fracture into a fine powder and are carried off by the wind. 7,000 tons of dust rise over 100 stories high and 200 miles wide to build a dust storm. The storm lifts off at noon each day with clockwork regularity blowing across Africa. At the Atlantic coast, it is drawn up higher into the sky and the prevailing winds carry it west and south 3,000 miles to its destination, South America, the Amazon. A hotspot of extraordinary biodiversity, the Amazon rainforest appears very rich, but its soils actually have depleted levels of several minerals including phosphate, as clouds from the Sahara rise high above the Amazon, minerals from what was once living plankton dissolve into water droplets, delivering thousands of tons of phosphate into the forest below throughout the wet season. These minerals pass through the top layers of soil to roots of trees, nourishing the entire rainforest. The Amazon is called the lungs of the earth, producing one-fifth of the planet's oxygen that is needed for life itself. For every leaf that exists now, three more will grow in a week. It is the culmination of a chain of events that began far back in time and halfway around the world. The migration of dust from the Bodeli Depression to the Amazon is one of the many ways in which life cycles on Earth. We are only beginning to uncover these cycles and for only few of the processes that sustain life in all its variety. We are still far away from understanding this interconnected nature that we call our ecosystem. Uh, 
Um, if you'd like to um, view the clip, uh, it's on the uh, Foundation's uh, website. And uh, it's also, of course, everybody has a YouTube channel these days. So, uh, But uh, in closing, I just want to suggest to you that I think we have every ability, actually, to solve this problem. Um, I think that uh, the remarkable work that I heard today uh, and the ongoing of efforts by uh, the whole team that's here and more uh, are the basis on which we will um, uh, solve the problem of uh, climate change. I just hope when we do it, we'll also think through in ourselves and on to our children and grandchildren. I'm a grandparent, so I think in grandchildren's uh, <laughs> lengths now, um, that we'll find a way to also respect that other infrastructure that, after all, is the context for all life on Earth. So thank you very much, and I'm happy for questions and whatever. <laughs> It is a little bit after five, and I'm going to turn you loose. This is the end of the day. This was an opportunity to learn about some of the stuff that's going on in the region and some of the possibilities that have been developed elsewhere. We've got a lot of work to do locally, but we also have a lot of people who are trying to do that work. And the best thing that I can say at this point is look around you and talk to the other people who are in the room and continue that conversation, because that's what we want to do and we'll keep working here. Thank you, thank you all. <laughs>